हाय हेलो नमस्ते टुडे वी राधिका एंड रोहित वेलकम यू टू येट अनादर एक्साइटिंग एपिसोड ऑफ द पॉडकास्ट सीरीज तेजस एंड इनिशिएटिव बाय एनएसपीटी वेर इन वी कवर ऑन्टरप्रनियल जर्नीज ऑफ औरंगाबाद संभाजी नगर सो राधिका लेट्स मेक इट इंटरेस्टिंग टूडे लेट्स स्टार्ट डिफरेंटली ओके फॉर द फर्स्ट टाइम लेट्स प्ले अर एपिड फायर बिटवीन यू एंड मी ओके साउंड गुड फैंटास्टिक सो आई विल जस्ट से अ वर्ड एंड यू हैव टू से बैक अ वर्ड दैट कम्स फर्स्ट टू योर माइंड ओके लेट्स डू दैट ओके सो क्रिकेट टेंडुलकर बैडमिंटन सिंधु म्यूजिक श्रेया घोषाल नाथ वैली दास सर and here we are <laughs> so what an introduction and that's why she is my wife you know <laughs> but uh, yes uh, today we are with someone who has deepest of the contribution in uh, shaping up one of the best academic institutions one of the best school in the city that's not valley uh, we have uh, someone who has done who has a great passion for education who has done masters from oxford into education sector came back to india and joined the school shaped it up so let's welcome uh, mr das sir mr ranjit das to our podcast thank you so much sir it has been great to have you here and it's our pleasure and fortune that we are uh, today sitting with you uh, to get to know the story of you as well as nath valley thank my you pleasure. so much my pleasure my pleasure so uh, sir starting with now uh, we would like to know that a young boy from up named ranjit kumar how he became mr ranjit das a national award uh, winning teacher would really really like to hear your story from your childhood to where uh, you have come today okay yeah so i have to go down memory lane i was born in a family of uh, bureaucrats my father was the dgp of up mm-hmm. and my uncle was chief secretary and health secretary of india so i was groomed to be a bureaucrat okay i was told of no other careers but you have to be in the ias or the ips oh. i preferred the ifs the foreign service foreign services so i moved to many schools wherever my father was transferred as dig or ig and all that but ended up in a school called lamartinia in lucknow which uh, was an icse school um, founded in 1840 oh. long <laughs> from there i moved to st stephen's college in delhi and took history honors because that was the most uh, important subject in those days to score marks for the civil yeah. service exam <laughs> So I spent 5 years in college did my bachelor's and masters and while I was there began to think that maybe there are other things in the world rather than the civil service so I began to explore MBAs and uh, uh law and things like that but finally I sat for the civil service exam in 1980 I passed the prelims and just then somebody rang my mother from a famous american school in masuri called woodstock and said we need a history teacher and will your son be interested so i had a bachelor's and masters in history but i didn't have a ba or any education degree but i had seen the school and it was beautiful so i said if nothing else i'll just go and visit the school and meet the principal and uh, some other people i knew there so i went then i got the job mm. but then i hesitated and i said to the principal who was an american man that uh, you know i i'm not sure whether i should do this i have the civil service exam and you know i have to apply for these mbas in america and he said ranjit stay for a year i'll give you enough time to study for the civil service exam and you can do your gmat and whatever else so i took the offer and i stayed I was enjoying teaching plus I was studying for the civil service exam when I suddenly decided that this is it I had never ever thought of teaching but I loved it I loved the school I loved the pure air of Masuri trekking in the mountains 
So I rang up my father and said, I'm not sitting for the main exam. Mm -hmm. Wow. <laughs> and I thought he said, no, no, come here, we'll discuss it. He said, Ranjit, you've seen it all your life. You know what it is from inside. Your uncle and I were in it. You're the right person to decide. Do what you want. Great. So great. And so I just started teaching. And, but then I got admission into Wharton and various other places where I had applied for an MBA. Mm -hmm. So I went to Mr. Jones, the principal, and I said, this, I can't leave. You know, I'm going. He said, Mr. Das, Ranjit, I'll send you to America. You stay here three years, I'll send you to America. Then you decide whether you actually want to stay in America or not. I know everybody wants to go to America. It's the golden dream. Great American dream. <laughs> the great American dream. So I took that offer. And then he did send me to America on an exchange to teach in a beautiful school called Northfield Mount Hermon. Mm -hmm. wow. And I was there for a year, enjoyed that experience, but said nothing like home. I gave up that great American dream, <laughs> came back to Woodstock and uh, started teaching. So that's, wow. that's uh, uh, the beginning of my career. So just to add on a lighter note, we have been from a generation wherein we used to run away from our teachers. <laughs> now, very interesting th thing that we were seeing before we were setting up the cameras that every student was looking at the watch and probably he, uh, he or she was looking uh, for you to be in the office at that particular time and coming here saying good morning, good afternoon. That's amazing. Good afternoon, good afternoon. Good afternoon, good afternoon. Good afternoon. Good afternoon. Bye, bye bye. <laughs> Especially when I remember our days. <laughs> but what a decision, sir. We can definitely tell that it has done greater goods for the for the students here. Just one phone call from Woodstock changed your life from <laughs> bureaucracy life. to teaching. Yeah. But then the big problem was that I couldn't be a teacher without a teaching degree. Right. Yeah. Remember, I just right. had a BA right. and MA in history. So Woodstock has a system of a sabbatical. After six years, you can take a year off and uh, upgrade your skills. Mm -hmm. My sabbatical was coming, so I went to the principal, who at that time was, had changed. He was a British man called Hugh Bradby, who had done a master's in education management from Oxford. Mm -hmm. So I said, Hugh, in those days, in Woodstock, you call everyone by the first name. So I said, Hugh, I want to do that course you did, master's in education management, which Oxford calls the governance of education. Mm -hmm. wow. He said, why not? So I applied, I got admission, and I went to Oxford and got that education degree. It's a <laughs> master's degree, a master's in educational studies with governance of education as the major. And so then I was qualified to be in the education field or in education leadership. So that's how. Then starting from Lucknow, Going to Masuri, then to the US, then to the UK, <laughs> studying at Oxford, Wharton, but still coming back to India. And that to not only India, Aurangabad, Sambhaji Nagar. What motivated you, pushed you here? So when I came back from Oxford with this degree that nobody else had in India, I was asked by many schools to come as principal. Mm -hmm. I was all of um, 33 years old. And I said, no, I want to be at Woodstock. And, you know, I was given a very important post as the high school coordinator. It was like a vice principal in charge of the high school. And, uh, but then I was contacted by Gulab Ram Chandani, the headmaster of uh, Dune School, who had just retired. And he said, uh, there is a group of people in Aurangabad who want to set up a school and they have retained me as a consultant. Would you like to go to Aurangabad? So I had been to Aurangabad as a tourist for Janta Elora with Woodstock students. And I said, okay, let me go and see the place, and meet the people who want to start the school. And that's when I met, met Mr. Kagliwal, Mr. Madhur Bajaj, Kumud Bajaj. Mr. Pradeep Dhut, Mr. Narinder Gupta, Arvind Machar, Mukund Bhogle, all our uh, eminent trustees mm -hmm. at that time, and discussed what their vision was 
and to see if it kind of uh, uh, matched mine. And we found an amazing synergy. They wanted to set up a world-class school. I had seen the most beautiful schools in America, in England. I had studied education management. I had studied comparative education systems in that course. So I thought nothing like getting a clean slate right. where you can write your story. Wow. So I came here, mm, I thought the trustees were really committed to the cause of education and uh, started working with them to uh, make this school where nothing existed. Right. Hmm. So that's how I came to Aurangabad. Wow. And stayed back. <laughs> and stayed back because, you know, the people were so wonderful, starting with the uh, board of trustees. Then the other citizens who had all come to Aurangabad to set up industry. The warmth of the general citizens whom I didn't know. It didn't have a culture like uh, you know, some of the northern cities have a certain amount of violence and, you know, lack of civic sense. It was more evolved, even then, at that time. So I thought it would be great to join other people who would come here in the journey of making Aurangabad really a top class city with the best infrastructure, industry, cultural life and... Uh, I told the trustees when they asked me, how long will you stay? Because they also had the same thing. He's come from Oxford and mm -hmm. Delhi and all that in America. So how long will he stay? So I said three years. Mm -hmm. I'll set up the school and then I'll move on. It's been 32 years now. I'm still here. So we have 30 plus years and you just planned for three years. <laughs> yes, absolutely. Wow. Three because of the reasons I said, you know, clean slate, a vision mm -hmm. the trustees had which synergized with the goals I had and uh, then the, the city itself. It's, it's a beautiful city to live in, historical and it was small then, which I like. Uh, so, here I am. <laughs> That's great, sir. fortunate that here you are. <laughs> and uh, just adding to this, since you mentioned industry, so, uh, sir, this is, this is our observation that uh, industry and this academic institution, they have some kind of correlation, some kind of connection. Uh, maybe to start with, many of the entrepreneurs in our, uh, uh, our generation, they are from Nath Valley. So, is there any peculiar reason behind this? Is there any peculiar thinking behind this? So, one of the things I believe that education cannot be done in a bubble. The purpose of education is to prepare good citizens, good people for the workforce, good people for the economic needs of the country. And therefore, the education system that we followed at Nath Valley School, apart from following the CBSE curriculum, that's the official right. curriculum, it has a framework and you have to stay within it. We went outside the framework and we said, the most important thing is to build uh, confidence, integrity, leadership, and uh, uh, workworthiness among our students. So that's why we had a lot of other activities apart from just teaching everyone A, B, C, D and 2 plus 2, uh, which uh, is known in the world of education as the three R's, mm -hmm. reading, writing, arithmetic, the three R's. <laughs> we said, you know, we will not be restricted to that. We'll make good citizens. Wow. You know, so that's that's what we did. Good citizens who will contribute to the country's social, political and economic life. That's that's really noble, sir. And uh, again, from our observation, what we have really seen is that uh, somewhere foundation of Nathalie School has also contributed a lot in bringing uh, some right kind of industries here. Because, uh, I mean, getting proper good schooling. Uh, I can imagine was really an issue at that particular time. There were certain good schools, but then seats were limited and uh, there were no good CBSC schools at that particular time. Uh, so I think that really uh, provided a good platform for people to settle here who are yes. setting up uh, their base in Aurangabad who are not originally from Aurangabad. Mm. For a city, I guess, to grow, 
to going from tier 3 to tier 1 mm -hmm. so uh, development of the city i guess uh, having good kind of transportation facility uh, actually uh, in a prior pod podcast also ram sir also said that aurangabad always had that logistical connections with other cities so it was easier for the industries to come but education is one big anchor which bring the families with them yes so once they settle down in a city with which has good schools i think that is one plus for the development of the city i i according to uh, the trail of nachwali i guess so you came here in 1992 the st uh, school started 32 plus years there is one big thing <laughs> But after that, it was on the outskirts of the city. You must have faced so many problems, sir, like infrastructure, logistics, I guess, water issues may be evident by then. How did you tackle them? How did you come about them? So we had all those issues. But mm -hmm. uh, for every problem, there's a solution. Mm -hmm. We found the solution. So we used to got, get tankers. This road didn't exist from Pethan Road to uh, North Valley. Yes, it was, a, it was a Kacha Road. Mm -hmm. Yes. Mm, so, you know, we worked with our trustees, with the municipal corporation and got the, the road built. In fact, the trustees contributed something towards that uh, road. Getting good faculty was the biggest challenge because, uh, you know, nobody would uproot themselves from Pune, Mumbai, Hyderabad to come to a city like Aurangabad at that time with limited infrastructure facilities. Right. But getting them, so motivating them, giving them uh, a vision, giving them uh, career prospects, uh, you know. And then they used to realize, yeah, Nath Valley is a school with a difference. Let's come here, you know, it's, it's not like a run-of-the-mill school. It's going to give us uh, the kind of satisfaction and recognition that we are looking for as educationists. So not only did we get teachers, we were able to retain them. We've had teachers who worked here for 32 years, 30 wow. years, 25 years. And uh, unless there are compelling reasons for them to leave Aurangabad because of husband's transfer or some other family, nobody leaves Nath Valley. They, they stay here and, um, and we built a nice what we call the Nath Valley family <laughs> of so teachers, nice. students, trustees, parents, you know, that kind of thing. And uh, that was evident uh, when I went and visited all my alumni in London, New York and San Francisco. Nobody realized that there were so many of them. I had uh, these dinner meetings with them. In London, there were 17. In San Francisco, there were 18. And in New York, a whopping 23 North Valley alumni who came and reminisced and sang the school song wow because they feel that family yeah so it's it's like once you are you are admitted into naturally it's for lifetime yes <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's true and uh, uh, i mean uh, uh, i have heard so many stories about reunions even at us not just in aurangabad even at uk pune mumbai uh, Every other city has an Atvali reunion. That's what we have seen. Yes, yes. And the big one here, you know, we've got some really dynamic uh, alumni, as you were saying, you know, they're leaders, they have those qualities, who've taken the leadership of the Alumni Association. And so the big events happen in Aurangabad, and yeah, everybody, yeah. it's like homecoming for mm -hmm. them when we have the NVAPL, yeah. you know, yes. cricket, football, basketball, all that going on, you know, teams made of alumni. Yeah, it's a big buzz in the city when <laughs> NVAPL happens actually. Yes, yes, yes. Uh, so, since you also mentioned about team building and uh, how uh, teachers have been there since long, uh, it's, it's really uh, creditable because uh, in any industry, maybe education, maybe manufacturing, uh, maybe anything else, uh, retaining uh, and making good team players is always a challenge. So, uh, what is the formula behind this? So, I believe that uh, every human being wants respect and recognition. And we make sure that every teacher is respected by the students, by the management, by the parents, recognized, given avenues for promotion. And basically, you know, if you treat people well, 
then they get attached to the institution. Right. And uh, so we have a very, very minimal attrition rate. That's great. This is uh, very nice. This is a very simple but very effective takeaway that uh, respect is the key to build a team. So I was going to say earlier when we were talking about students and you know when the students come and greet me. And so the same applies there. I remember when I first started teaching, I used to read a lot about teaching because I hadn't done a B.A. Yet and so on. So I used to read lots of books and articles on teaching. And the one that stuck with me is the secret of education lies in respecting the pupil. Mm. <laughs> now we do it the other way around. Mm. The student must respect yes. me. <laughs> but if you respect the student or you said, you know, they all like to be with me. Uh, or, you know, stu uh, students are like uh, echoes, you know. You get back what you give them. So that's True. it. True. Right. Absolutely. <laughs> so. so I think your set of ideologies are so perfectly put forth. Because I, I had, before we uh, uh, spoke about taking on this podcast and everything, I had uh, some kind of discussion with some of your alumni students, which are uh, obviously our friends and everything all around this thing. So they always tell us that, you also teach history in school, I guess. Mm -hmm. So they all they told me that history class was so uh, enthusiastically taken by everyone because you never taught from the books. It was outside the book. They had chapters in the books, but they were able to visualize everything which was outside, inside. They were everyone had that evident memory of you teaching history and they taking history in a very uh, what do you say? like a uh, movie going on that uh, I guess in World War One and World War Two were their favorite topics is what I got yeah, yeah. from <laughs> our friends. Mm. So whatever set of ideologies you have imbibed in the school, the students have taken it up. That's so nice. It's so nice. <laughs> it's great to hear. Yeah, I still teach a bit of history but in a different uh, in class. It's called General Studies. Mm -hmm. And as you know, General Studies is now a very important uh, paper for the civil service exam. You do one subject, but you have two papers on General Studies, which is knowing everything about the world and India that is going on and having opinions on it. So, CBSE has a, a compulsory class called General Studies. Mm -hmm. There is a textbook that has things like the Indian Constitution and then human rights and uh, national movement, problems of India, all those sort of things. But I start the class with current affairs, mm -hmm. it's current history, you know, what's happening in Ukraine and Gaza and South China Sea and Sri Lanka and, you know, mm, Sudan, Indian political uh, situations. And the first 10 or 15 minutes is just discussing that. And every okay. student has to have his or her own newspaper. Mm -hmm. Wow. And that's the class starts with that. So there again, everybody gets really interested True. in current history. You know, I don't teach uh, except the national movement, which I still teach. So I feel that's very important to get kids to contribute, understand, comment, and form their own ideas and opinions. Mm -hmm. You know that. Uh, that's true. So mm -hmm. Visualize what is. And the visualize it. Right. Sir, so as we were discussing history and how it is also your favorite topic. Uh, now, what I firmly believe is that uh, a lot of leadership lessons could be drawn out of uh, the history. And uh, so since you have been working in this academic domain, uh, in addition, uh, you have been very closely connected with the industry because um, the founders, trustee members of the school, they, they are eminent industrialists. So uh, I just wanted to ask you how these history lessons uh, or leadership lessons, which can be taken out of history, how they draw out in academics as well as in industry. So, what is your take on that? You see, as everyone says, history in itself is a great teacher. Mm. You learn lessons from history. See, everything else may change, technology, science and so on and so forth. Human beings are the same now as they were 6,000 years ago. Right. Mm. So, the pattern of behavior is the same. So, if you study history, yeah. as a young man, you get the experience of 
5,000 or 6,000 years. Right. That's true. <laughs> and if you study the causes of events, good or bad, you learn lessons from them. What leadership style succeeded in the world? What leadership style failed in the world? What kind of characteristics and behavior patterns have benefited people in the past? Because history just doesn't mean you study presidents and prime ministers, you study right. economic history, social history. So if you are a serious student of history and not just studying it to crack an exam, if you get interested in it, you draw lessons from it. And as somebody said, those who do not learn the lessons of history are condemned to repeat it. <laughs> so, <laughs> so if you learn the lessons and implement, so that's how, so I've learned all these uh, things. And one of the first things I learned was that draconian leadership is going to give you only temporary success. If you want long-term success and if you want people to follow you, then you have to have a democratic leadership style and also a leadership style that empowers people and does not concentrate power in one hand. Mm. Right. Because all models which were the opposite have failed and resulted in the collapse of that regime or leadership uh, position that anybody may have had. So these are the two big lessons and so many other lessons you learn from history. But you have to read history with an open mind and say, I want to learn not just the dates and the names and the facts. <laughs> I want to read between the lines and see what worked and what did not work. Now the same thing applies to industry. Absolutely. So whatever management gurus teach you in industry, uh, and when you do MBAs or you know, when you do management, uh, business administration, is based on the history of management. Right. That's true. Now, the best way of doing an MBA these days is the case study method. Yeah. Now, what is case study? It's a history. It's a history. Something so. that happened, what worked, what didn't work, what styles work. And so, I think history has a very important role to play. That's why in the ICS that the British had in India and then its successor, the IAS, mm. when I said earlier that history was the best subject. So they wanted you to know history because then you understand human nature. So if you, you, you don't need to be a technocrat, you can get a technocrat to help you build a bridge or make a road or you know do other things. Uh, finance or whatever, but you need somebody who understands human nature and history teaches you that. It has come back today. In the Western world now, they are looking for people who have mastered uh, humanities. Humanities means history, political science, sociology, right. economics, mm -hmm. English. So earlier they used to look for technocrats yes. and you know <laughs> BE and MBA now they're looking for humanities graduates wow. because uh, it teaches you all the things I just mentioned earlier and uh, so STEM was the big thing once upon a time yes. right? yeah, yeah. It, it is buzz buzz. Again. so now it's STEAM okay and what is the A that has been added arts wow. <laughs> wow. Science, technology, <laughs> engineering, mathematics. That was STEM. Yes. Now it's science, technology, engineering, arts, and, and maths. maths. Many people are happy that arts is coming before maths. <laughs> <laughs> Actually, on a right, lighter note, I was thinking that to be a good employee now, please take history seriously. <laughs> <laughs> Pick up good lessons from history. Yeah. So employee as well as employer. Employer, right. <laughs> both. Both are So when you said earlier that some of my ex-students still remember my lessons and all mm -hmm. that. So apart from teaching them outside the book, telling them other stories related to the topic there and other incidents uh, which were interesting or humorous or whatever. I used to also say, what do you learn from this? Mm -hmm. What do you learn from the fact that Hitler lost the Second World War or Napoleon became such a fantastic general and ruled the world but then collapsed. So what do you learn from it? 
and those are the lessons that you are talking about, leadership, teamwork, empowering others. Absolutely. Sir, uh, I really liked uh, the sentence that you used just now and I think it could be the basic principle of leadership that leadership is not about concentrating power in one hand but it is about empowering other people and mm -hmm. formulate more and more leaders. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Yes, that's that's something which is I mean very relatable uh, to me being from industry. Mm -hmm. So let me ask you, uh, you have been an audience as well as an active participant who has seen the uh, change in educational landscape in Aurangabad actually, because uh, we started naturally with the foresight. You had a very good team, a synergistic team with you, which helped establish Nath Valley in Aurangabad. There are also other good institutions which are coming to Aurangabad, like NSBT, who is upgrading itself in higher education sector. So, what are your thoughts on this? How, what are your thoughts on how did the educational landscape of Aurangabad change and about the new in, in institutions coming in? So, I am delighted that Aurangabad has now become an education hub. Yeah. From a city where there was no CBSE school, North Valley was the first apart from the Kendriya Vidyalaya, okay. to 35 CBSE schools, mm. ICSE schools, there's an IB school. So it's become an educational hub and uh, without trying uh, to be immodest or modest, I'd say that North Valley uh, led the way, was the torch bearer. When people saw the success of Nath Valley, they said, oh, we could do it. Now, for any city to grow and for any city to attract new investment and uh, new companies coming in, you need the social infrastructure, which is schools, colleges, hospitals. Right. right. So, school education, we were the torchbearers. And now that uh, Aurangabad is getting uh, so many school graduates coming out from grade 12 onwards. It needs colleges and it's wonderful that uh, Mr. Kagliwal um, has founded the NSBT, the Nath School of Business and Technology, which aims to provide the best in class education right. in business management, technology, in um, uh, entrepreneurship. And uh, I think uh, it's going to be a path breaker again in Aurangabad for higher education. So that's as far as uh, business and technology is concerned but then you got the IHM uh, mm. yes. in hotel management yeah. and so the Taj Hotel came and then you have uh, other institutions like MGM and you know, Devgiri and, and uh, each one is contributing something or the other and uh, each one has a different field of operation but it is indeed making uh, Aurangabad an education hub and uh, earlier it was known as an auto hub, mm. auto ancillary hub but now I think it's also known as a that is changing. Uh, yes, uh, <laughs> education. education hub you know there are a lot of good schools and colleges coming up and, and I hope that uh, NSBT expands and gets other courses and gets uh, other degrees and it will because it's, it's focusing on excellence yeah, the curriculum is really uh, at par and very different from Yes, us. and with somebody like Mr. Jaju leading it now, <laughs> I think it has a great future. <laughs> Truly. <laughs> and uh, talking about education, sir, there is one more initiative uh, which is that way very big, uh, which we were talking about the other day. Uh, that is uh, Aurangabad Police Public School, uh, which was initiated, founded by you. So, uh, would you like to tell more on this? What was the idea behind it? So, the idea came from Mr. Anami Roy, who is an iconic uh, police officer of Maharashtra. Mm, he was police commissioner of Pune, police commissioner of uh, Mumbai, he was DGP of Maharashtra. So, when he was uh, in Pune, he tied up with symbiosis and started the uh, Pune Police Public School. Mm -hmm. and when he became DG, he said, let all commissionerates have a school like that. And he came here, met Mr. Bishnoi and me and said, would you do it? Mr. Bishnoi was the CP here. And we said, yes, of course. And I, uh, it idea resonated with me because, as I told you, my father was DGP of yes. UP. So, you know, I belong to the police family, as it were. Right. So, I readily accepted. We set it up. 
uh, in I think 2008 okay. and okay. Uh, now it has uh, almost 1700 students it's doing well oh, wow. uh, it has uh, policemen's kids and other students uh, it, uh, it's a state board school but uh, the idea is North Valley should also have some social responsibility. So long before the CSR concept came for industry, right. <laughs> we took up this as a social responsibility. Wow. We don't charge any management fees. Uh, it's a pleasure for the Aurangabad Vidya Mandir Trust and North Valley School to run that school and contribute. And I always tell the parents of the policemen's kids, ये हम आपके लिए कर रहे हैं, सेवा कर रहे हैं। आप ईमानदारी से हम लोग को सेवा दीजिए। And uh, so, हाँ साहब, that's but now how far it goes, I'm sure it's having some effect. But uh, that is something I keep emphasizing. And these children are doing very well. The other day I was at the Taj Hotel. And one young man came running up to me at the end of the function and he said, Sir, do you remember me? And I said, I'm sorry, I don't. I was in the Aurangabad Police Public School and now I'm in charge of reservations here. Wow. Oh, it's, wow. <laughs> and it's really amazing. So yeah. It's stories like these mm. which really mm. underline the success that is behind that. <laughs> yes, absolutely. So I think rather looking at your journey of 32 years, 32 plus years, I think, I guess asking you the challenges about running the institution, I guess you must be having a big pitara of <laughs> rewarding moments like these, what you what you mentioned now, like students coming up to you or the alumni coming up to you. Would you like to share some with them? So, you know, mm, wherever I go, I make it a point to meet the alumni and partly to applaud their successes, but partly also to ask them what new we should do in the school, how can we upgrade the pedagogy as well as the infrastructure and all that. So I get excellent suggestions. Mm -hmm. But yes, uh, you know, the, I can't even think of the number of experiences I've had of uh, students uh, all over the world in different professions, uh, doing well, each one of them a success story in their own way. And uh, that is the greatest uh, reward of a teacher or a principal. So I love telling this uh, little anecdote that you know the uh, bunch of friends who were in school together when they were grown up and you know they made it in life probably in the early 60s got together and some alumni meet and they were asking each other you know how successful they were and so the bottom line is always money. Mm. So. He says, so, what do you do? So, I'm a banker and I make 100,000 a year. I'm an IT engineer, I make 200,000 a year. I'm uh, a um, scientist, I make 250,000 a year. I'm a banker, I make 500,000 a year. Then they came to this man, he said, I'm a teacher. I make lives. Oh. Wow. <laughs> wow. So let me ask you this. To what do you attribute the success of Math Valley School today? So I think there are many reasons for it, but the foremost reason is that Nath Valley School is not a commercial school. Mm -hmm. It was not set up to make profits for the trust or the owners, you know, to take home as a business mm -hmm. enterprise. Mm -hmm. It was set up to provide Aurangabad an excellent educational institution and uh, set the trend for education in the region. And we've tried to make it as modern and as up to date as possible. Most other educational institutions are today run as businesses. And you look at the profit first and how much you're going to make mm -hmm. rather than um, what is the next investment I can do to make the school better. Mm. So, to give an example, 
suppose we do make a surplus. Now everybody is talking about the new changes in the school, the excellent IT facilities, mm -hmm. the new iconic building. Everything has been done by the school itself. So any surplus generated goes into improving the quality of the infrastructure, the quality of the training given to the teachers, the quality of the technology uh, facilities and equipment. So that is what makes the school excel. Right. Because there's, there's no uh, cutting corners or shortcuts, you know, how can I make, uh, you know, save money and, you know, right. uh, put it in the bank for myself or, or trustees or, or the owners of the school. Of course, there are many other reasons related to this. So we are able to give teachers excellent training. We are able to pay competitive uh, salaries. We are able to get best in class uh, uh, computers and uh, best in class sports facilities. We have a FIFA equivalent football ground. Oh. Wow. And suppose this was a for-profit organization, the money that went into that would have gone into somebody's bank account. Absolutely. Absolutely. So basically, quality education, good teachers, and good students who will be good citizens yes. is what the motto. you are making. <laughs> so that's great. And uh, now there is one very particular question that keeps coming to everybody's mind these days. Is that what is the effect of AI? What is the effect AI is going to have on the current education? For example... Like live, <laughs> live topic nowadays. Yeah, because there are a lot of videos on YouTube, those keep circulating, in which uh, that chat GPT is integrated with some kind of robotic pencil and it is writing the homework. So, what is your take on that, sir? Is it a challenge? Is it a boon? How exactly uh, educational system is geared up to uh, face that or use that? So, like anything in the world, it's how you use it. It, how you take advantage of it and how you make sure that the disadvantages are removed from your way. For example, I mean, if you are ill, you take an antibiotic. Mm. Yes. But that's limited use prescribed for a particular <laughs> thing. If you take antibiotics as your daily meal, it's going to kill you. <laughs> Otherwise, it saves you. Very true. AI is like that. If you use it, for a purpose that is well designated and controlled, it can augment your learning multifold. Mm. See, AI is just basically an advanced encyclopedia. True. We used to use Encyclopedia Britannica, which is a beautiful set of books. Big book. and yes. Look yes. for information. Now, you still need information and you get much more of it with the encyclopedia. AI. That's true. So it's the perceptive. <laughs> now, if you misuse it, if you don't control it, if you don't tell your students how to use it, then it will dull your mind because you will not use your mind. You are just copying everything or getting this AI pencil to write it for you. And when you come to the real test, which is a admission test to a uh, you know college or uh, to the civil service, or when you have to go and appear for an interview for a job in a company or when you have to set up an industry, you don't know anything. Mm. Will I, AI be there right there at that point to advise you? No, you have to use your brain. So if AI is being used to develop your brain in a controlled manner, it is the best thing that has happened to education. But if it is misused and used for everything under the sun, then it will just make you an unemployable and uh, basically a, a non-performing citizen. That's true. That's, That's it. True. The idea of education is to develop your body and your mind. If you don't develop your mind because you are using AI as a crutch, then you've lost the, the game of life. So, uh, I, I agree with uh, what you are pointing upon, sir, that uh, how to use it <coughs> is, is the real key here. Uh, educational institutes uh, can at most give the awareness of uh, using it for good. So I think uh, that's 
that's that's a real thing uh, that uh, students or anybody need to incorporate upon yes so today we have the person who has conceptualized the whole idea of tejas the podcast series an initiative by nspt mr harsh jaju sir and uh, sir now as he is here i would also like to ask you one more thing how do you see uh, the approach of people who are coming from industry into academic sector what difference is made by them typically taking liberty of this thing because he comes from industry <laughs> <laughs> well i have seen many such instances it's actually a seamless transition because some of the principles and concepts that you use in industry are taught to children in an institution and even in the management of the institution you can use the same principles i just talked about gulab ramchandani yes before he became headmaster of doon school he was the managing director of blue star air conditioners wow <laughs> and he was one of the finest headmasters of doon school because he was an old boy he had studied there so he knew the ins and outs of that school <clears throat> but apart from that you see what do we teach students in a school we teach them personality development we teach them to work hard we teach them to do their assignments with full vigor and attention uh, and honesty so uh, we teach them to be leaders we have a student council here likewise in a business you have a board of directors you have other uh, organizations or sub groups where discussions happen so if you've learnt certain aspects of management in an industry it can easily be transferred to uh, a school now obviously a person who's come from industry does not know the subjects being taught but as i said earlier in one of the points that what you need is experts and you can ask depend on experts to do those things by delegating your authority and so on so you can get teachers but you know how to motivate teachers because you learned how to motivate uh, uh, your executives and uh, colleagues in a company so the same principles apply and it's just a slightly different context mm -hmm. and for that you can get uh, academicians who advise you thank you for the endorsement first of all <laughs> makes me a little more relieved uh, i have been pulled into this very unexpected uh, but to check i have to take this opportunity one i have always been jealous of your immaculate dressing sense <laughs> so, uh, let me tell you that today so lots to learn on that front but more importantly sir you in your long illustrious career with academics you have seen a lot of exceptional teachers developed them also groomed them also probably taken in some very ordinary people and they have become very extraordinary it's with the state that not very good now sir what according to you are the exceptional qualities of a great teacher of a true teacher and let me also set the context here so why i ask this is because from our times students have also changed technology has been changed and teachers have changed I believe there are a lot of good things which have happened but there is a lot of dilution also which has happened. So your message to the teachers of today of what they should never forget to be. So the first thing is that a teacher cannot consider their profession as a job. It's a passion. and if you're a passionate teacher who's come into teaching because you always loved teaching and were inspired by one of your good teachers you will be a fantastic teacher so that's the first thing the minute you start thinking it might teaching job is you know 8 o'clock to 3 o'clock when is the bell going to ring you'll never be a good teacher then you're just there you know because you needed a job so good teachers have to if they don't already have a passion for their jobs they have to develop a passion for their jobs the second is you have to realize that you are not working for the management or the principal or the director you are working for your students they are your real masters 
if they are happy, you've done a good job. And believe me, every teacher knows, every good teacher knows after they have done a good day's teaching, what great satisfaction you get. You go home feeling so happy. Wow, I saw that sparkle in a kid's eyes. And you know, that kid really enjoyed the class or my whole class looked mesmerized by the math lesson I taught or something like that. You know, get that, what they call in America, the aha experience. Oh, that's it. Okay. So, if you have that, you'll always be a good teacher. And believe me, a good teacher goes home happy and lives a happy life. Uh, obviously, you have to keep yourself updated with the latest in your subject. You can't just live on these nice philosophical concepts. Right. You know, you have to uh, know what the latest uh, methodologies are in teaching. Use the latest technology in teaching, you know, like laptops and smart boards and so on. But more so in your subject, because whether you're teaching biology or you're teaching uh, mathematics or you're teaching history or political science, much has developed in the way it's taught and assessed. Now there's this big thing called uh, uh, higher order thinking skills. Right. So you have to incorporate all those uh, new systems in your delivery of uh, what you're doing. So, but the bottom line is, as I said earlier, the secret of education lies in respecting the pupil. If you respect the pupil, they'll respect you, they'll enjoy your class. Uh, you need to have uh, an emotional connect with the students and um, you will definitely be inspirational and your students will never forget you. Fantastic. Simplicity in all the complexity, respect the pupil. Okay. Don't forget your constituency. <laughs> yes, absolutely. <laughs> Thank you so much. Sir. Thank you very much for that. And before they conclude this, I invite you to NS meeting. Please come. I will. And please come soon. <laughs> I will, I will, I will. I've wandered through the corridors for various other events, but I'm sure uh, there's been a lot of change since you've been there. I'll definitely come. Sure. Thank you. Mm. Sir, uh, finally, a lot of students lot of alumni and their parents are going to be watching you and they're excited to watch you. So any final message for them? Yes, uh, you know, to summarize all that I've said, um, Aurangabad is a great city. I love living here. Education is a passion. And even today, the happiest moment of my day is when I'm in a classroom. <laughs> not sitting here and, you know, doing finance and management and recruitment and all that. And the message to students is, dream big, be passionate about your dream and no power on earth can stop you from achieving that. Wow. So nice to meet all of you. <laughs> Thank you so Thank much, you. sir. Thank you so much. It was great to be here and hear your thoughts. Uh, thank you so much for giving us time. So, uh, that was Mr. Ranjit Das with us. Uh, we had a delightful conversation with him. And very soon, next time, we'll meet for the next episode of Tejas. Stay tuned. Signing off, sir. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Thank, thank you. you. Thank you. Thank you.